to evolve in, in the next few months, in the short term, in fact. Um, then I want to talk a little bit about the European Union CEDAC relationship, the bioregional uh, process. And then finally, uh, I wanted to, I'd love to say a few words about, uh, about Brexit, about the upcoming referendum in the United Kingdom on, on the membership of the European Union. Dan, Dan touched on this yesterday, so I'm really comfortable on that particular point. It's uh, telling, I think, that when you look up transatlantic cooperation, the topic of this session in any academic search engine, um, virtually all of the articles or, or references that, that show up uh, relate to the United States uh, and its relationship with, with Europe and the European Union. In some cases, uh, they talk about NATO, uh, Canada features, uh, but it's, it's less frequent, and Latin America less frequent. Again, and that reflects, I think, a mindset uh, that dates from the Second World War, from the hierarchy of interests that, that that's, uh, came following the Second World War. Um, and in particular, I think the security relationship between Europe and the United States uh, during during the post-war period. Uh, I think for a sense, for many countries in Europe outside of the larger ones, uh, smaller countries in particular, the relationship with this part of the Americas is only really beginning to catch up uh, with the relationship with, with, uh, with the countries to the north. The Americas is the region of the world with which Europe has the, the greatest connection. Uh, the vast majority, as you know, of the non-indigenous population of this part of the world is of, of European descent and societal structures in this part of the world reflect those of the European countries uh, from, from which the population uh, came. In essence, we have shared roots, uh, not identical, the roots aren't identical, we've developed in different ways over the centuries and in different directions, but fundamentally there is an enormous amount of DNA that we share both literally and metaphorically. I think that commonality is something that's easy to overlook or is easy to dismiss as being a sort of rhetorical device, particularly from a European perspective. But when you look at our relationships with Asia and with Africa, you immediately see that, relatively speaking, we have an enormous amount of, of shared history uh, and shared cultural links. And that leads to the question of shared interests, uh, shared perspectives, how these can be identified how they can be harnessed uh, to help both regions face the challenges of the 21st century. This whole conversation about a, a wider link with the Americas, uh, a relationship which is focused less exclusively on the US and Canada and gives more attention to Latin America is something which is quite new. Uh, for uh, we're at the beginning of a process of recasting our relationship with, with this part of the globe. We're, uh, very much at the beginning of a process of developing a strategy to guide our relationship with the Americans as a whole and for the first time to have a particular emphasis on, on Latin America. We've traditionally had very strong relationships with the US and Canada. Um, there are obvious explanations for this. There are large communities of Irish origin in, in both of those countries. That's also the case, of course, here, here in Argentina. And we've had an embassy here since 1949 and indeed um, the delegation uh, before that, before we even achieved our, our independence. Um, there, there are other factors in play, obviously, as well, geographical and, and linguistic. Part of our internal challenge in Ireland is to shift uh, the mindset that looks across the Atlantic and automatically sees Boston um, or New York or Washington or Toronto and to try and orientate our domestic thinking more towards Latin America and the relationships that we have here. Uh, the opportunities that this region uh, presents, whether they be economic or, or political or social or, or cultural. In a way, that process is actually uh, happening itself organically anyway. I returned to Dublin um, about a few months ago, after four years in, in, in India, and um, it is striking how much more visible Latin America and Latin Americans are in Ireland uh, than they were in, in the past. When I was studying Latin American politics and literature in university 25 years ago, there were probably a dozen people from Latin America in the whole of Ireland. Um, now, you go into any shop and there are probably a dozen people from Latin America. Um, working holiday agreements and student mobility means that there are there is a very visible presence of, of young people from Brazil, in particular Argentina, uh, Chile, um, and, and other 
counterparts and also job opportunities that have arisen in our high tech sector have attracted a lot of people from, from this part of the world. This is a project that we'll be carrying forward over the remainder of this year, uh, consulting academia, <coughs> business, cross government, and the hope is that we'll have a strategy for, for government towards the end of the year to, to, to basically direct our relationship with this region over the, over, the, over the future. It's an important development for us and it has the potential to completely remake our relationship with this part of the world and hopefully then the resources will then follow to in order to, in order, in order to, to implement that. Those bilateral relations, of course, are only part of the story. Um, we're a member state of the European Union, um, and the relationship that we have with Latin America as a consequence of that is also highly significant. I had the, the pleasure of chairing the EU Latin America EU LAC process, as it was uh, back in 2004, uh, in advance of the EU LAC summit in, in Guadalajara in Mexico. And I returned to the process a few months ago after more than a decade, and I was surprised at how little changed. Um, I, since 2010, with the emergence of CELAC, the process has become more focused. There are certainly more trade and association agreements, cooperation agreements between the EU and the individual countries or groups of countries in, in, in Latin America than before. But the biggest weakness of the process, its working methods, I haven't really moved on that much. Back in 2004, I spent three months locked in a room with the representatives of the Latin American embassies in Brussels, negotiating the, the summit declaration and summit outcomes of Guadalajara on, on behalf of the European Union. What started off as a three-page document with maybe a dozen or so points ended up as 15 pages and 104 paragraphs that covered everything from HIV AIDS to HIPAA debt relief, to domestic <coughs> violence, to the transport of radioactive waste. Now these are all undoubtedly very important issues and in their own right, but I wonder to what extent each of those are genuine priorities for the EU Latin America uh, relationship. I think the challenge in the EU CELAC process is to make it tangible, uh, to make it focus and ensure that it focuses on genuine <coughs> shared aims and outcomes. We often talk about the strategic nature of, of the process. And back in 1999, where we all began, um, there was a strategic partnership that was agreed and, and ratified. But I think that deep down, we all know that it is certainly strategic in terms of, of being a long-term investment. But in many ways, it's far from strategic in the way that we go about our business. Important, yes, strategic, less so. One of the studies I read before I came here added up all of the commitments made by leaders within the EU, but EU uh, LAC or EU CELAC process between 2007 and 2010. They came up with 2,443 separate points. Now, things have improved since the launch of CELAC, but the summit in Santiago in 2013 agreed 48 points, and then there were 77 at the summit in, in Brussels last year. That's better than the 104 points that we managed under the Irish presidency back in 2004, but it's still too long. Um, and it's the wide-ranging nature of, of our summit outcomes and our declarations and our action plans, meaning that it can't really be described as a list of priorities. As the expression goes, if everything is a priority, then nothing is a priority. Now, there are a number of explanations for the lack of focus. When you talk about the EU and you talk about CELAC, you're talking about two very different animals. Um, CELAC isn't centralized in the way that the European Union is. Uh, it's essentially a group of individual states um, acting, albeit with some um, degree of, of coordination. And there's no prior secretary and presidency is limited on the ability to speak on behalf of member states. And of course, each country in the process, whether in Latin America, the Caribbean, or the European Union, is keen on seeing its own preoccupations and priorities reflected in the outcomes of, of the documents or of the summits. And that applies to, say, to, to countries from both sides. But we're coming close now to the 20th anniversary of this process. And it, it strikes me that we, we do need to try and break out of this cycle and, and look to see how we can agree on how we jointly respond to global events and global challenges, both in the immediate and longer term. We need to be more focused. We need to be more action-oriented. 
there's plenty of proof that progress is achievable. When you look at some of the greater challenges facing the global community, there is already an encouraging and growing level of convergence between the two regions. Climate change is an area that's, uh, that, that springs to mind. Uh, it's a pillar of the strategic partnership, but you know, we, can, we can do more. Sustainable development is another. Uh, disarmament and non-proliferation, long history of like-mindedness mindedness there. The key is to focus on the positives uh, and to those areas and themes where progress can actually be made. I mean, we're never going to have an identical worldview across the two regions. But we do have enough in common that over the years we can legitimately hope to see a greater level of convergence. Our view, the Irish are very pragmatic people, um, is that we need to focus very much on pragmatism and um, there have been proposals for formal coordination mechanisms in New York and elsewhere. We would certainly like to see more dialogue in advance of major UN and multilateral events and we're confident that over time our positions will begin to, to converge. Uh, likewise, we'd be in favour of more regular structured political dialogue in, in um, New York and Geneva and Vienna. We think in advance of the Fifth Committee of the UN where there are issues of shared interest, you know, there are opportunities there for, for discussion. And also political dialogue in, in Brussels. Um, the relationship is a long-term project, uh, but to maintain momentum coming up to the 20th anniversary in, in, uh, in 2019, and importantly to ensure political engagement, we have to make sure that it's relevant and focused. It's, it's difficult to persuade senior ministers and prime ministers to attend events or to engage in processes where they perceive that there is a lack of substance. We've made a lot of progress over the years, but I think you know, a lot more needs to be done to improve it and improve it uh, further. Finally, just a few words on, on Brexit. Um, as you know, the, the referendum is due to take place just over two weeks in the United Kingdom on their future membership of, of the European Union. Um, I think as Dan pointed out yesterday, a, a vote to leave the EU would be unambiguously uh, bad for Ireland. Uh, the UK is one of our largest, largest trade trading partners, and economically, a departure would, would have enormous ramifications uh, for us. Uh, a lot of it is to do with uncertainty. We have no idea what the future trading relationship between the UK and the rest of the European Union will be. We don't know how long it will take to negotiate. We do know, however, that it will be disruptive and it will be destabilizing. At a time when we're already challenged by low growth, by high unemployment, and other economic challenges, not to mention migration and, and other factors. In terms of Britain's trading relationship with the rest of the world, it's worth remembering that the European Commission, rather than member states, negotiates our trade agreements. So the United Kingdom hasn't negotiated a free trade agreement of its own in a generation or more. Um, and there's an enormous amount of technical expertise which is involved in, in that process. Um, so it, there is a, an issue around technical expertise that they would need to develop very quickly in order firstly to negotiate their own relationship with the European Union and then to negotiate the web of free trade agreements that the European Union presently has, which is 30 or so. Um, as we've seen with the EU Mercosur talks, this is not a, a short process. A trade agreement can take years or even decades to, to agree, and it's certainly not something that can be done overnight. From an Irish perspective, the, the political and security implications are also enormous. The peace process in, in Northern Ireland is underpinned by EU arrangements, and not least freedom of movement. Um, my, my family lives in, in the North of Ireland, and uh, I'm constantly moving, have been for many years, been moving up and down between Dublin and Belfast. And the border between the two parts of the island was previously very heavily armed, very heavily fortified, with you know, troops, and, and it was very, very evident the security presence. Now, whenever you travel north, the only change is in the road markings. Um, and also, you move from kilometers per hour to miles per hour in the speed limit, but that, that's it. Um, and that, that's helped to, to modify a sense of grievance among some parts of, of the community, around, particularly around the border, uh, in the north about partition. The division of the country is much less obvious than at any time since partition. And that contributes to the maintaining of consent to the status quo amongst parts of the community, which in itself is linked to security issues around paramilitary activity. The reintroduction of a hard border risks undoing a lot of what has been achieved in, in recent years. Um, it's been a suggestion that the common travel area wouldn't be affected between Ireland and the UK on the basis that it pre-exists 
uh, the, the, the membership of both countries in the European Union. But at the same time, um, the Trump Triangle area has never existed during the phase in which one country was in the EU and the other one. So we're very much uh, entering into to unknown territory. And it doesn't take into account <coughs> issues around customs and immigration, given that immigration is in fact control of borders is one of the, the primary pillars of the, of the Alpha argument. Um, as Dan mentioned yesterday, the British also bring a lot to the internal dynamics of, of, the, of the European Union itself. And from a philosophical or policy point of view, they, they bring a, a lot of degree of pragmatism and problem solving. The, the, the Irish government has been very, very active in articulating our concerns uh, and encouraging Irish people in the UK to vote to remain in the European Union. Uh, our Minister for Foreign Affairs and Trade has visited, uh, as indeed the British Prime Minister has, various ministers have visited. They've spoken to Irish communities in Britain. At the end of the day, this is fundamentally a question for, for the British people to decide upon. But you know, that said, foreign policy is essentially about defending or advancing your national interests. Um, I think given the fact that Ireland is the other member state that would be uh, the most affected by the, the, the departure of the, the British from, from the European Union, it's, it's only rather proper that Ireland should, should make its view.